That's it, guys. Success. That's with us. <laughs> Can you guys move to your right, please? Awesome. Roll. <laughs> a little bit over to your left, like half step. Yeah. And How's spread that? Up. Social distance spread a little bit. Yeah, good. Good evening, and thanks for joining us. My name is Ryan Harris. I'm the executive director of the nonprofit Oxford American Magazine. If you're new to the Oxford American and just discovering us for the first time, welcome. We hope you'll stick around. You can become part of the OA community by visiting our website, OxfordAmerican.org, following us on social media, or subscribing to the Quarterly Magazine. Tonight's event, Jazz and Civil Rights, then and now, is part of a multi-day residency the Oxford Americans producing here in New Orleans uh, in partnership with the National Park Service. Uh, but more than that, it's part of an ongoing conversation the Oxford Americans have been facilitating for the last five years through our No Tear Suite project, which you'll hear, hear more about tonight. We're really grateful to our presenting partner, the National Park Service, for these events. Um, we're working in partnership with them uh, on this residency. Uh, but in addition to the National Park, I want to thank all of our sponsors and partners who have made this possible, including the Lower Mississippi Delta Initiative, Stella Boyle Smith Trust, Little Rock Central High School National Historic Site, New Orleans Jazz National Historical Park, and John Lafitte National Historic Park and Preserve. It's a mouthful. Uh, I'd now like to turn things over to Ranger Karen, and uh, she's going to tell you a little bit more about the parks and uh, her role. Hello. I'm Ranger Karen. I work with both the New Orleans Jazz National Historical Park and the Jean Lafitte National Historical Park and Preserve, the National Parks of South Louisiana. And the National Park Service is very proud to be partnering to present this conversation tonight. A little bit about where we are. We are at Marigny Studios, which in the 1950s was a dance hall in the Marigny neighborhood just downriver from the French Quarter in New Orleans. Now it's a professional recording studio, so our panel members are sitting uh, in front of lots of musical instruments and recording equipment. And this evening is about the, the intertwining of jazz, which was born here in New Orleans, and the American Civil Rights Movement. And Little Rock and New Orleans have a shared history in this movement. In 1957, Nine young men, uh, sorry, nine young people, men and women, uh, desegregated Little Rock Central High School. They came to be known as the Little Rock Nine. Three years later, just 60 years ago this month, New Orleans began to desegregate its schools, its elementary schools, with four six year old first grade girls. The struggle for civil rights continues, as we know, and tonight we're going to talk about the deeply rooted and sometimes subtle ways that jazz has influenced the civil rights movement. Moderating our panel conversation tonight is Gwen Tompkins. She's a journalist and public radio veteran. She's currently the host of Music Inside Out on uh, New Orleans public radio station WWNO. And she's the New Orleans uh, reporter for NPR's World Cafe. Um, I'm going to turn things over to Gwen and our panel. I hope you will enjoy this conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ranger Karen. I really appreciate being here. I'm thrilled to um, both uh, and very grateful to both the Oxford American and to the National Park Service for um, its support of this wonderful event. Um, I want to start off by mentioning... Uh, Charles Houston, who was one of the great legal minds of the 20th century, he was one of the architects of the legal attack 
on Plessy versus Ferguson, the um, Supreme Court ruling that uh, that uh, mandated separate but equal um, facilities around the nation. He said this really wonderful line that I want to share with you all, and that is the test of character is the amount of strain it can bear. Right. So he might as well have been speaking for most of the musicians who are on the stage <laughs> here tonight, as well as uh, as well as our guest who's on um, who's visiting with us remotely. The No Tears Suite that uh, the musicians here have uh, have created and brought into the world. Um, this has taken five years to create as a jazz composition uh, to arrange for symphonic orchestration to record as a studio album and for the musicians here to embark on what may be a never-ending educational tour of master classes. Their goal is not only to share wonderful music, but also to uh, acquaint audiences with a pivotal moment that revealed the American character at a moment of extraordinary strain. Does that sound familiar? Well... Stick with us. Um, to my left, Kelly Hurt and Christopher Parker are the people who wrote uh, the words in music to the No Tears Suite. They've come to us all the way from Little Rock, driv dri driven here all the way from Little Rock, actually. Uh, saxophonist Bobby Lavelle. He is uh, he was one of the original players on the No Tears Suite uh, 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 performance and subsequent um, recording, and he joins us also. Uh, and then we. Uh, we lastly have Kid Jordan, the saxophonist and educator uh, who has, um, oh, well, he's a lion of New Orleans and, of course, uh, uh, free jazz. And he is joining us remotely. And uh, I want to say hello to all of you, Kid Jordan, Bobby Lavelle, Christopher P uh, Parker, and, of course, Kelly Hurt. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. <laughs> <Our pleasure. laughs> Okay, so let's start with you, Kelly Hurt and Chris Parker. Um, you're commemorating the 1957 integration of Central High School in Little Rock, which is based on the memoir. Your work is based on this memoir called Warriors Don't Cry by Melba Patillo Be Beals. Now, Miss Beals's book was not the only memoir that was written by a member of the Little Rock Nine. But what, what was it about her memoir that spoke to you, that inspired you all to want to create this work? It Actually, it was really the first of the nine to actually speak. And there are actually some of the nine that still will not speak about it. And if you talk to Dr. Beals directly, she'll tell you it took her, oh, what did she say? Five to seven Five years to of years. therapy to yeah. write the book. And yeah. she's written a subsequent, a subsequent book, uh, March On Girl, Elizabeth Eckford, the lady you see in most of the pictures walking by herself. And, and being sort of being sort of catcalled right. by this yes. crowd of very angry people, many she, women. Yeah, yes, she has written uh, some accounts, but Miss Dr. Beals, to me, is the definitive work, and it, it, it describes in detail the selection process, the training process, and all three attempts to go into the school and then what that whole first school year was like. And if you've never read it, it is both m some of the most engrossing and disturbing literature it's you will ever personal. read. <laughs> but uh, it's a testimony to the human spirit. Uh, yeah. These were nine children. These weren't grown people. These were children who did what the entire legislative body of the state of Arkansas failed to do. So it was, it was a huge undertaking, and they weren't aware of what they were doing. So it was really the only primary source at the time that I felt I could turn to. Interesting, mm -hmm. interesting. And so Kelly Hurt, uh, there's some powerful phrasing in this in this suite. Um, particularly, it starts in the, in the overture actually, midway through the overture, and you start mm -hmm. talking about by the numbers, yes. and you sort of, uh, you know, give give sort of a bird's eye view. 
of yeah. how this all, you know what I mean, of all the people, I guess, you know, I mean, not to make light of it, but, you know, it's it's an equivalent of of all the gin joints in all the world. She had to walk into mine. And so, <laughs> and yes. so of all the people who were involved in the civil rights movement, it all comes down to these nine little kids. Yes. You know, well, they're not little kids. I mean, they're high school students. Yes. But they're kids. But they still are kids. Yeah. And um, that was the essence that uh, Chris and I agreed that we wanted to just distill everything to that because after you put all of this weight on these kids and you go beyond all the, and everybody, you know, a, applies all of what they feel the kids need to do, need to go through. Uh, in the end of it, it was the children's decision to just basically get a better education and have fun for a year. As uh, Dr. Veal said, um, we thought we were going to have fun. We thought we were going to have a good time. And even when the bad things begin to happen, didn't realize that they weren't just going to happen for a couple of days or months. They happened for years. Mm. To she, she still does not reveal yes. names and locations of her personal children. No. They still have death threats. They still have threats. They still have many. They still had many issues and obstacles, all of them to overcome. But at the end of it, one thing that they really appreciated was that we got to the the essence of it, just that these were nine people, young people who decided to make a decision and it just ricocheted and just affected their parents, their other relatives, their neighbors, their friends, people who didn't even know them and and, and that and to have that a powerful effect that'll just affect you for the rest of your life for the rest of your life mm -hmm. exactly bobby lavelle you were born in memphis yes. and all i don't think that you're old enough to have been around in 1957 <laughs> when this was happening but can yes, you you were <laughs> yes i was a kid my um this uh, being a part of this project uh affects me tremendously i can't begin to tell you when I was a child and I would get on the bus in Memphis, Tennessee, it, the driver would say, all colored to the back. When I would go downtown Memphis, there was a water fountain that said white. There was one that said colored. I remember the Dyer Restaurant. It's a big building, had two entrances. One was for whites and one was for blacks. And the diner where the food was cooked was in the center. The black side was never kept very well, the other side was always pristine. So I, I live the civil rights movement, you know. I, so this is very important to me. And the thing that I can say from reading the book is um, people think that these kids went into this school and integrated the school, you know, and you know, a year later everybody was happy. What they experience is like what Chris has said and what Kelly has said, that they are being traumatized by it now. But further than that, and um, the black community is being traumatized in this country by people not knowing their history and believing that things that happened prior were a lot rosier than they were. Uh, D.L. Hughley, the comedian, says... The most dangerous place for a black person is in the imagination of white people. And I hope they hear that. I hope that does not anger you, but enlightens you. Mm. You know, that's, a, that's my purpose. I hope something that I say rubs you a little bit. I hope it rubs you into the point that you want to know. Jeffrey Robinson, who was born in Memphis, Tennessee, has a series of... Um, lectures you know, that you can find on YouTube and other places 
where he talks about our history and the history that we refuse to talk about and the history that if we don't get onto the table, we won't correct the problems that we are having today. Well, you know what's interesting, though, about this very point that you're making, and I'm so glad you made it because I was planning on asking both you, of, of you um, to talk about it, which is when I listen to the original se- uh, sextet um, uh, performing the No Tears Suite, my immediate reaction was, this seems familiar to me. I heard something very similar to this or participated in something similar to this in church. Because in church, in, particularly in black churches, there were all kinds of uh, not recreations of events, but at least recitations of events, you mm-hmm. know, um, and all. And so it, I remember churches being um, sort of places where these kinds of stories were told until they got into the history books. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Is, was that your experience as well, Kelly Hurd? Yes. Yes. And and uh, is why I agreed to do it. And I was just uh, saying earlier that Chris and I, we always get into this situation. It's <laughs> It's as if... We'll we will agree to do something because it well he didn't mention this but one of the reasons we even had this book was because of his best friend and uh, he gave us that and Miss Beals' book Dr. Beals' book yes mm-hmm. and when we moved to North Little Rock ten years ago I noticed for the first time the actual. The Testament, is that the name of it? There's the statues of the Little Rock Nine. There's bronze statues behind the state capitol, and it's called Testament. Testament on the north side of the capitol. It is beautiful. And I was like, I never, because we never went that way, you know? Yeah, yeah. (laughs) So, And I was like, I I never noticed that. Well, it had just recently been set up. And I began to start asking questions, and our friend Danny Brown, he would, you see, he said, you know, you need to talk, you know, ask some people about it. And we were fortunate enough to just start talking to different people who were historians of Little Rock. And they would say a little bit about it. And then we started realizing that people didn't really talk about it. His dad didn't talk about it. His mom talked a little. She told us a little story about it that he may tell you more of. And about her experience during that time, one of that day, one of those days, and she was a child, and but no one really talks of that period because it was a very, very emotional and upsetting period that people they say that was a bad time for us. That was really a bad time for everybody because it. It was very painful. And so was it discussed in churches in the ch- in churches that you uh, that you recall or um, or treated in any kind of way in school? Um, where For did me, you learn I about this? I first learned about it um, being from Memphis as well, which is steep, <laughs> which is not that far from, from yeah. Little Rock, of course. It's just and a and hours, I had right? heard of it through school. Yeah. Through school and um, just different just different periods of my life, I would just be reintroduced to things. Okay. Well, and telling the stories. That's my, my family always told stories. So, <laughs> And that was a way that I would kind of, you know, you kind of find out about things. and Sure. You know. Well, well Christopher Parker, um, you know, Kelly Hurd has given you a great lead up. Do you want to share the story that your mother told you about her experience as a, a young white woman or well, a young girl in, in Little Rock in 57? Uh, yeah. Uh, during that time period, my mother lived in the housing projects. And in the 50s, housing projects were not considered black neighborhoods, first of all. Housing projects were integrated low-income housing. That's right. So she lived off of 12th near Pine and Cedar, which is real close to Central High. Her father had disappeared many years earlier into the United States Secret Service and apparently never existed according to government records. So her and her mother grew up, and um, her mother died when she was 13, 
So she learned to get around on her own at a young age. And she was told, don't go to Central High School today. Don't go in that neighborhood today. It's going to be an ugly event. She thought that the integration was a celebration. It had been in a newspaper. So she thought that there was going to be a lot of people there and it was going to be a big party. So she skipped school. And she went to Central High School. Well, when she got there, there was these hundreds and hundreds of people who she thought were there to celebrate the Little Rock Nine. And as the children began to come in, a photographer, when we had real flash bulbs on cameras, flashed her in the face as she was looking, and she said it was like a moment when everything... The she woke up a little bit and she realized she wasn't looking at a celebration, she was looking at an angry, violent mob. And mm. I mean, if you know the story, it took them three attempts to actually get in. At one point, there was a thousand people trying to block their entrance. Uh, at different points, that included the National Guard was trying to prevent their entrance. That's why Eisenhower federalized the troops because Faubus had actually used troops to block the entrance. So it was violent. And once she realized exactly how violent and scary it was, adults began to tell her, little girl, you need to go home. You're gonna, this is going to get ugly. And so it freaked her out. She ran all the way home. She ran in her room. She locked the door and hid till her mother came home from work. And, of course, her mother said, I told you, don't go down there. But... Her recollection was, I thought this was a celebration, and when I got there, I realized that they wanted to kill these children, and it was one of extremely traumatic event for her because she didn't have, as a child, she didn't know the social ramifications of what was actually going on at that time. Well, so she didn't know to hate. Right. Is what you're saying. <laughs> Neither did she know that everyone yeah. there was there to hate. Was right. there to hate. Exactly. And, and, yeah. Well, I tell you, Kid Jordan, I wanted to thank you for uh, for joining us. And I want to ask you, I mean, uh, uh, as a, you know, as a, a, a performer and as a young person during the 1950s, can you bring us back to your experience during that time? Where were you in 1957 when all of these events in Little Rock were taking place and unfolding? Were you here in New Orleans or were you elsewhere? I was at Southern University in Baton Rouge. And uh, we all heard of Sarah And he was a Sarah Sanders was a cool thing. He was, a, he was a new guy on the block. Everybody was like that. <laughs> and when I heard him, I, we, I, when I heard him, I thought, I heard it so to me, because that was a real deal to the young man. Mm. Uh, Pharaoh's from Little Rock, Arkansas. Oh, I see. I mm. see. Yes. And the thing is, and so what's, you know, I think that, um, People tend to, uh, as you said, um, Mr. Lavelle, you know, people tend to look at history as something that was already settled. It's all been settled, you know. Mm -hmm. But when you're going forward, when you're looking forward, Mr. Lavelle, Mr. Jordan, you know, nothing is resolved. <laughs> nothing mm -hmm. is sure. And so in Baton Rouge or in Memphis, if you were in Memphis, what were those days like when you were seeing these kids trying to get into the school? I wasn't of an age where I saw it. And so I'm not, I'm, I was born in 1951. Okay, so you were so really I learned, small. So I learned about it, but as I said, my experience, you know, with the, um, the civil rights movement and the prior to the civil rights movement is something that's, that it, it's, it's very vivid in my mind. Being on a bus... And if I'm seated and a white person got on that bus and there was not another seat, he said, get up. And you had to surrender your seat, mm -hmm. you know. And, and the reason I bring this up, because I need today's people to try to understand the trauma or the uh, 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 lasting trauma that these events have 
on someone like me. You know, I had um, another experience where my little brother was playing with a candy gun, and, and it was clear plastic, and you, you shoot the candy, and then he's shooting cars. The police ran this child into the house, hmm. and I came out, and they told me to get back in the house. My mother came out, and, you know, and they said, what's the problem? And I'm going to try to make this story a little short, but I want you to know what happened. Uh, They said, your son has a big mouth. She said, what? My son has a big mouth. She said, I'll tell you what. If he broke the law, take him to juvenile court. If he didn't, leave him alone. They left. The very next night, they knock on the door, and I go to the door, and I open the door, and the police officer pushes me and says, where's the fight? I said, there's no fight here. And he starts to walk into our house. My mother comes up the corridor, and she said, officer, I will speak to you in my living room. And, And he grabbed my mother. And at that point, I attacked him. The other officer attacked me. To make a long story short, I was arrested and my mother was arrested for Mm. no good reason. And uh, 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 I was traumatized that night. They slapped me around and stuff and did a lot of things and told me they would go back to the house and kill all of those ends, you know, in that house, you know. and, And it was this still affects me when I see some of the things that are going on in the streets of our country now. Well, I truly believe until we in this country dig up the dirt from our past. And I want to, at this point, I want to share something with you. And what, what, what affects me about this at this point is that so much of this, you know, I'm just, you know, hearing about. I knew about these things. This is a specific story I want to share, first of all. This guy, Sam Holes, in Atlanta in 1900, had a fight with his boss. The boss tried to kill him. He ended up killing the boss. After that happened, they accused him of having raped the boss's wife to ex- exacerbate and, and uh, accelerate the situation. Well, when they finally caught this man, they cut off his nose, his ears, his toes, his fingers, his gentle, genitals, and his tongue, all while he was alive. They doused him with uh, kerosene and burned him. They took pictures of it, and at a picnic later on, they would sell the pictures and even the body parts. Robert Charles of New Orleans, you know, knew of this story when he had an encounter with the police. And I'm not going to go into the full story of that. But what happened is, from all of that precipitated a riot that happened here in New Orleans in 1900. Now, from 1900, I'm going to give you a, a, a chronological of lynchings. No, no, no. I understand that. I I, I appreciate that. But I I have to say that because I I would really like to talk a little bit about more about music and the role of between music and and what we're talking about. Gwen, I will truly make the connection. (laughs) All right. I'm going to give you one minute, if you can do it in one minute, because we're Um, really pressed for time. So I want to make sure everyone has a chance to speak. Okay. I Mm -hmm. understand. Yes. Well, um, I'll tell you what. I will be, um, because... um, I kind of feel like you're getting a little uncomfortable with this. Well, I'm gonna, I, mean, I, I, well I, I can dispense with it. I can tell you this. My dad is a jazz, was a jazz musician in Memphis, Tennessee. And one of the things that he did is he would bring white people to our house, the musicians to our house, so that we would have personal encounters. You know, I don't have any kind of bias in me. And I thank my parents for that because I've always had encounters. This man is my brother. You know, I love him dearly. Okay, so uh, I don't want you to be uncomfortable, but I think it's important, you know, that we start to look at what happened in this country that causes what, uh, before that what's causing what's going on now. Mm. That's that's what I'm saying. Sure. Okay. Mm-hmm. No, no, that makes a great deal of sense, actually. And the the point that I uh, that I was oh, I'm hoping that we can um, we can get to is the fact that this has been a very long very violent and unpleasant um, uh, story that has, you know, periodically some extraordinarily hopeful moments. Yes. (laughs) You know, and the story is as yet unfinished. But what's interesting about the the black American experience or African American experience um, uh, on this continent is that musically, that story has been told, whether it's been in the history books or not. 
You know, it started with spirituals, from spirituals to gospel music, from gospel music to the blues, from the blues to jazz and all. And so, you know, each, you know, um, you know, each uh, generation of musicians has been trying to tell, you know, to tell its its piece of this story, which is really interesting. And so I wanted to ask you, uh, Mr. Jordan, during those during the 1950s, during that time when you were at Southern University, and if you can speak up when you when you answer during those late the late 50s, you know, I mean, were there musicians around you? Were you interested in representing this particular moment in, you know, I mean, in the life of the of the nation, in the life of African-Americans who are trying to integrate schools? I was. Uh, I particularly in Farrell Sanders, by him being a young man playing that kind of music. Farrell was ahead of the majority of the people that we heard in universities. But Farrell, as a young man, was really laying it down. I mean, he was playing some stuff that we heard Tran doing and thought it was such a magical thing at the time. So I really was impressed and still impressed with power. I can do some things now that I turn my head. So it's, it's, that's, that's the kind of thing that, that really got to me. And I, I don't think I'm much older than Farrell. We might be the same age, or we might be around the same age. But I had come up listening to Bird and different other people. But when I heard Farrell, Farrell wasn't playing Bird. Farrell was playing the new music. Yeah. You know, so. And, and, you know, it was part of the, the music of the civil rights. That, you know, that was the new music, and all the hippies was into it, and the civil rights people. They were dealing with it. So we had to, and one thing about music, whether you, when you listen to it, whether you like it or not, if you listen to it enough, something about it is going to make you want to jump into it or, or do the latest thing. One thing, music always keeps doing some of the latest things, or some of the things that's happening at the time. Really true. You know, on uh, on Music Inside Out, this um, this uh, talk show that I do with musicians, I can't tell you how many musicians have talked to me about how inspirational the Miles Davis album 4 was to them, right? Which is 4 was a live concert that was recorded in 1964. And, uh, and if you're a trumpet player, if you're a keyboard player, if you're a sax player, you know, if from New Orleans at least, you're probably going to like four, which is like one of the great live recordings. But what people don't often remember is that four was a live concert that was uh, put on in New York to raise money for the uh, uh, for the vote for voting drives in Mississippi and Louisiana. Hmm. OK, and so the, the marriage between music and uh, and civil rights or music and, um, you know, and uh, improving the human condition, you know, is such a natural marriage. Mm -hmm. It really, mm -hmm. really is. And so let me ask you this now, when um, Christopher Parker, of all of the songs that are on um, the no, uh, the no tear suite. My favorite, I have to say, my favorite composition is the one that's called "To Be a Kid." <laughs> <laughs> to be a kid. I mean, I re I wrote down actually. It's not too sweet. It's not too hard. It's music that begins to skip. You know, with a child like uh, like a heart of gladness. Yeah. You know, and all. And so how do you how did you approach this song in terms of trying to weigh the you know, what I mean, the, the gladness in the heart of a child next to the gravity of history? Uh, well, if you really listen to it, the beginning and the end of To Be a Kid are, are quite different in mood than the body of the song, especially the end of the original recording, the end of it is uh, really quite sad and melancholy. Uh, so the message was, um, what is it like to be a kid when you're called on to do the work of the grown people? 
Yeah. You know, and you don't know what you're doing. You you're just you're doing it. It it feels as far as I could tell, it feels very strange and it when I talked to Elizabeth Eckford a few months ago, it seemed that it took her decades to just recuperate from she she honestly said, I thought I was gonna have fun. Yeah. I thought it was gonna be a cool experience. And then the rest of her story was I spent a few decades in St. Louis just wandering around trying to pull myself back together. So it was like, yeah, we're kids. We have the childlike spirit. But at the same time, I can relate from some other experiences in my life. Sometimes you don't get to be a kid. Right. You're a kid, but you're not, you don't, your life doesn't go that it's not all lollipops and we're going to play in the park and everyone in our house gets along. Perhaps you come from a broken home or a home where you have to grow up way too fast. So I was just playing with that the duality of both being a child and being confronted with real adult issues. Exactly. And, and do you have any thoughts about that as well? Well, I, I think I remember when we were sitting there talking uh, to her and she recounted that um, during this whole process when they were at Central High School – and there was a dance that was going on. Was that back at Horace Mann? Right. And, and there was a dance, and they were all excited because they were going to be back with their friends. Because Horace Mann was the black yeah. high school yes. in, in Little Rock at the and time. I currently teach orchestra. He teaches at Horace, at Horace Mann. <laughs> <laughs> but they were, going, they were having a dance, and they were excited because uh, they were going to be able to hang around their friends again, you know? And yeah. Kind of feel... Better, you know, like they used to feel and, and hang around with each other. And she said, and you want to know what happened? Well, we we all got there and we kind of tried to mingle with everybody and everybody was all excited. And we all ended up all together in like one area of the place, just all together. And then she said it was when we realized we can't go back. We can't even we can't even hang with our friends anymore. We can't be as carefree as we used to and because it and that she said that that happiness and then that melancholy and everything. She said that was real and and that was kind of when we all kind of realized every time we would go somewhere and they would try to separate and not go places together, they would always end up being together. Being together. Yeah. Well, it's true. I because mean, of the shared experience. The shared experience. That's mm -hmm. exactly right. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it is a, it's going to bind them forever. And it did yeah. bind them forever, actually. Yeah. But I have to say, I mean, you, you know, um, you, you say the names today. And you normally, just as in your, as in the, um, in the selection called roll call, you say their full names and all, and they sounds mm -hmm. all so important. But then you look at the names: Minnie Jean, yeah. Terrence, Thelma, yeah. Daisy, Jefferson, Carlotta, Elizabeth, Ernest, Gloria. I mean, these are people that we all know. These people, you everybody know. knows a Gloria. Yeah. Everybody knows. A, oh well, I wish everybody knew a Minnie Jean. That's that name's not so popular anymore. But these are like real people, you yes. know, real real young people. But you also bring up a really interesting point, and uh, I wanted to ask you, Mr. Lavelle, about it. You know, at that time in 1957, when. Uh, before uh, President Eisenhower sent the, um, s you know, I mean, uh, uh, federalized the the National Guard, the Arkansas um, Guard, and uh, uh, to protect those children, uh, there was only one jazz musician who came out strongly and spoke, it, you know, spoke uh, 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 in a way that would uh, that would um, get President Eisenhower's attention. And shame him <laughs> into action, and that was Louis Armstrong. Mm -hmm. You know, what I mean, who everyone, you know, so many people at that time, particularly black people, thought was out of step with mm -hmm. the race question, mm -hmm. you know, and all. And so, why do you suppose so many jazz musicians were so quiet at that time? Uh, I can't speak on okay. that. Okay, kid, kid Jordan, yeah. would you like to share? Yeah, I can speak on that. 
there was a lot of prejudice going on. Like a young person come up, I remember I used to have some ideas about music that people thought I was completely crazy. And I wish I could be doing them, doing some of them things now. Uh, they were, they say, man, this dude can't hear. He don't hear this, he don't hear that. And we were breaking things down instead of just playing the blues. There's a lot of different ways you can play things. And people from different generations uh, break down. You don't have to play exactly one, four, five, like they were playing the blues before. And some of the people used to say, man, kids can't hear. And I'd be, I'd be, I'd be right in the supposed to be, and I'd be doing what I was, and it was all prejudice going down. And some of the musicians, when you came up with something different, a new, uh, and practice on something and got it together, they look at you like you're crazy. And some of them would say, oh man, I can't use kids, because kids are going to be doing this, he's going to be doing that. But I was trying to inject some of the newer things that I was hearing at the time. And it may be the same thing going on now, because I see some youngsters that I hear them talking like, say, man, this dude so I say, watch him. In the next five or 10 years, if y'all let him go, he may not, he may not make a whole lot of money, but he'll, he'll be able to, uh, to deal with what's going on. And, so why do you and, suppose, uh, Mr. Mr. Jordan, why do you suppose so many jazz musicians, prominent ones at that time in the late 1950s, so many were, were quiet at the time of uh, the Little Rock uh, Central High story? Why, why was Louis Armstrong out there by himself saying, look, well, President Eisenhower, do something? Well, you know. They were, make, they were making gigs, and they thought, I guess, if they would get out too far, that they wouldn't be able to make the gig. And after they heard uh, Cecil Taylor and some of the other people, I mean, the music, even Bird, Bird at a time dealing with his stuff. But Bird went to Canada and all different places. But it was, a, it was just a, a problem getting new music out. Trent had problems getting his music out. He so did. Any, anything new, you know what I mean? You just have a problem getting old. And it took the swing out of it, you know. Mm. So it ain't got that swing. But uh, with me, it's a, the, I didn't care about swing or how the changes went down of it. I knew if I was playing correctly that I was doing what I wanted to do. And you have to have nerve in order to do that. A lot of people didn't have enough nerve to stand on a bandstand. And people say, man, you can't hear. How somebody can say, Cecil Taylor can't hear. You understand what I'm saying? So, understand what you're saying. All, that's right. I mean, <laughs> I don't know. Like Cecil, and he, he, he even at one time, they said Miles couldn't hear. He said, man, Miles right. can't hear. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, but everything... Everything must change. As old as I am, I'm looking for changes now. Well, I'm sorry. I, I wanted to. I wanted to. I think Chris Chris Parker wanted to respond to something you were saying. So go ahead, Chris Parker. What's interesting about what Kid is saying is that first of all, he didn't give his background. Kid came up playing the straight up and down one four or five blues with guys like Guitar Slim. It wasn't that he hadn't played the blues. I mean, it, tell me if I'm lying, kid, but you played a whole lot of blues gigs. <laughs> I mean, the real blues. <laughs> so for you to make a departure, that was your choice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that's then right. I... That's what we had to do as black men did. Because it was all night long. Now you, you changed keys. But you be going, it, it was wonderful because it puts you in all kinds of. But uh, now the, the kids playing F, B flat, they didn't put you in any kind of key, and you had to hear it. It would open our ways up. But now you talking about put a, a blues in D, a blues in 
Fair for me to also glean from what you're, from what um, Kid Jordan is saying that musicians who were interested in continuing their careers, particularly those who are on thin ice anyway, because they're mm-hmm. they're doing something unusual in the business, they're doing something unusual in music that they felt perhaps that they could not afford to draw negative attention to themselves for fear of losing their careers. Yeah, that was the conflict. Um, that was now that was taught to me that was um in in my singing career it's i've sung many different styles and everything and part of that is because you have to have the confidence to step out and just do it (laughs) and a lot of times uh, being a musician, you are confronted just as you are with everyday life, or whether you want to um, step out and rock the boat. And like I said uh, earlier, we didn't know that we were going to just doing this project in Little Rock um, just made a lot of little bitty waves for us, Is which that right? we did not know. We did not expect that. So describe and, waves. Um, <laughs> describe waves. Well, you know, motion in the ocean, the way. Uh, <laughs> well, I'd like, to, I'd like to share a story. Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah, I was having a conversation mm-hmm. with a friend of mine about black men who had businesses who had failed. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was my per- little understanding that they didn't work hard enough, they didn't do what they uh, should do to maintain their businesses. And then it was brought to my attention that the white business owners who were in the same business got together and operated their business at a loss for more than a year. He couldn't afford to do that, and they put him out of business. You know, so in... To say that the, all the other musicians didn't support the effort, I would think would be entirely uh, 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 a misnomer. Okay. I don't, I don't, I'm, you know, as I said, I'm not old enough to have been there. But the musicians that I know, and especially those that play this music, mm-hmm. you know, are um, very, very, very uh, uh, well-read, are uh, very in touch with what happens politically uh, throughout uh, the nation and the world, you know, they have, they, they're some of the most fascinating people. I enjoy talking and listening to them. I learned so much, you know, but I don't want to say that their courage wasn't there, yeah. you know, but I do know that all of us as human beings, survival is the first law that we have to recognize to be able to be okay. That's what so I'm going to kind of close it out there. I would think it would be more something like that than that they didn't support. Mm-hmm, they yeah. probably had to pick their support you in specific ways. Right. And the <laughs> other thing that I have to say about 1957 in that time, see, uh, a lot of times uh, people think that media was like it is now. You didn't hear about those things. You didn't even know what was going on if it didn't happen in your city. It wasn't on the news. It wasn't on the news until later. It may have been in, on the news in New York and some other more progressive places, but not in the South, mm-hmm. not where I was. There's so much of things that happened, so many things happened that we found out about years later. Years yeah. later. You know, and, 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 and now we're, and you can attribute that to the entire country when you think about so much history, like some of the stuff that I was reading, you know, that it it. it it, it upsets our stomach. It bothers us. But we've got to go back and dig it up mm-hmm. and look at it so that we can understand what's going on now. Because we are all of the result of our up of our past and Absolutely. of our experiences. It's true. It's interesting that you should raise these, ish- these questions um, about, uh, you know, picking your battles, 
you know, musicians who pick their battles, particularly at a time that's that was so fraught mm-hmm. um, in not, American Not just history. musicians. I mean, just uh, everybody. Oh, oh, in, oh in every walk, like, you know, But just you for the purposes know. of our yeah. conversation. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we're talking specifically yeah. about musicians, but it's true, you know, because Armstrong was also criticized because he didn't march, you know, with, mm-hmm. uh, you know, what I mean, during, at, you know, at Selma and at different places, and he said, uh, my concern about marching, he said, was that I knew that the first thing that would happen if there was violence was that someone was going to hit me in my mouth, mm-hmm. and if mm-hmm. I can't play trumpet, then I'm no longer Louis Armstrong, Absolutely. you know? And so, you know, so, it, it, you know, you're, you make great sense, actually, when you're talking about, pick, you know, knowing where you can be the most effective, where it, it won't kill you. Yes. yes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, yeah. mm-hmm. uh, there's just a, cu- a few short things. <laughs> of- yes, sir. Yes, sir, Mr. Jordan. And that was thing had a lot of racism going on, too. You could do some of the rhythm that we were dealing with, the other people that we were playing with couldn't couldn't deal with it. it was too advanced. Rock and roll, they talked about rock and roll, but a lot of musicians really didn't get into the real rhythm part until they got the rock and roll. And they were learning rock and roll like they were learning uh, ABCs at one time. I remember musicians saying, man, how y'all do that, man? How you do this? How you do that? and have to go through, especially in them turn back, when they be playing some stuff, and put a little, look back, drop a beat, say, man, y'all lost a beat, y'all drop a beat. Say, yeah, we did all kinds of stuff in order to get the music old, because everybody doesn't feel, y'all know they don't, everybody doesn't feel music the way we feel it. So that's one of the, the great parts of music that we lost coming from from playing rhythm and blues in the jazz. And a lot of the things in the in the jazz thing didn't get over. They had to had to, they had to compromise in order to do it. So that's, that's one, one big, big thing. thing. That makes sense. Uh, the, musicolo- the musicologists don't get into that part. But I, I that's one one of the parts that I deal with. I even see some little kids now that's doing rhythm then have another group of kids that can't do it to save their life. They manage to so and so and so. So it's, it's one of them kinds of things. From the, from the, and it had a lot of racism in the 50s. A lot of stuff going on in the 50s. And if you didn't, a lot of musicians really didn't want to play rock and roll, whether they all know that or not. But it set up the music so they could go out and make money. Some people would say, man, I don't want to play no more rock, or so and so and so. But they had to do it in order to make money. I think rock and roll helped music in a way, and sometimes I tell people, it sort of retorted me. People look at me like I'm crazy. I said, man, during the rock and roll, during that period, they had a lot of young, I know I was dealing with young people then, and they were all over coming up with all kinds of rhythm and all kinds of things. But the people, the musicians had lost the people. And if you lose them, then you don't have a gig. Does that make sense? It does make sense. Mm-hmm. It does make sense. Mm-hmm. And you lose the people. Some of that music was just too hip for what they, they couldn't dance. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's true, you know, it's true what you're saying and the idea of rock and roll and um, versus jazz and both both genres. It's foolish to really think about genres because I don't think musicians ever really care about genre. No. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> but, you know, but except in the marketplace, you know, but in but the thing is. But both, uh, you know, what I mean, but musicians in all genres are trying to, in some way, testify, give mm-hmm. witness to their time, yes. um, irrespective of the instrumentation or the genre. It seems right, but mm-hmm. um, uh-huh. but at the same time, I, I didn't want to. I did want to um, to go back to you, Chris Parker, because you were just about to say something. Well, uh, all those conversations brought up a few things, and then what kid just? You also have to remember. There's a famous story about Charlie Parker going up to a concert of one of his idols who had chosen to play rock and roll to make a living 
and then taking a man's horn to see would it play more than one note at one time. <laughs> so yeah. even within the musical community, there was there was a certain type of a divide of uh, I. I'm trying not to just go into more of a street vernacular, but, <laughs> um, you know, man, I'm trying to make a living, man, and you over there playing that mess, trying to play that advanced stuff, and you need to get mm -hmm. away from me because I'm trying to make a living. You're going to mess it up for me. Mm -hmm. And I had many older musicians, a, a, a pianist from Charles named Charles Thomas, who could play any type of music there was, but for a living, you may hear him play Blue Eyes Crying in the Rain or Floyd Kramer, mm -hmm. or Bette Midler's Wind Beneath My Wings. And then when people left, you may hear him play Un Poco Loco by Bud Powell, or uh, McCoy Tyner Baha'i Festival, or John Coltrane's The Promise, and then another person walks in a room and he plays Chariots of Fire. So he was, <laughs> he was very well versed, but he remembers a period of time when uh, playing so-called hip music almost identified you as a uh, undesirable musician within the music community itself. Mm. Right. I'm not talking about white people, I'm talking about black people. I'm talking about black musicians, I'm talking about black musicians. Right. An mm -hmm. upstart. Man, you trying to <laughs> man, you trying to mess this gig up for me. We trying to make this money playing summertime for these white folks, and you over here trying to play like Coltrane, and you're going to mess this gig up, man. We ain't calling you no more. Right. And I think Kid experienced more than his share mm -hmm. of that kind of situation because he wasn't going to compromise. <laughs> you, you wasn't going to compromise. I don't compromise. Hallelujah. That's the abstract truth. Yeah. Mr. Jordan, can you speak up, please? Because we yeah. want to hear you, but I'm having trouble hearing you. Mm -hmm. I said, that's, that's the hallelujah, that. that's the abstract truth. I go on a gig, and people say, that man got a degree, he done been to school, but listen how he play. They shouldn't even let him in this place. Said, that's all right, I'm still going to do what I want to do. Want to do my thing. Black musicians. That's right. And so, and so, let me ask all of you. You all are all musicians. We'll start. We can start with any which way you want. You know how? I mean, when you are creating music, do you know? Is it uh, in within your experience where you want to create something with a political message or? Or does the music just begin as you know? What I mean, in a in a different realm, and then and then happen to take on a political message. It it does for me. It just I like, as I said earlier, a lot of different styles. Styles, mm -hmm. but um, when you say that, it just kind of morphs. Sometimes our music we've we've been told quite often that our end results are political and we've had to be okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> but they don't start political. They don't necessarily start that way. Mm -hmm. And, um, I mean, we don't, um, for this project because of the content, of course, right. But some of our earlier works, they didn't necessarily start out that way. I've written songs about being in Dubai and uh, having to stay on a plane and while the sheikh and the sheikhs and their uh, entourages get off planes. I've actually talked to different people across parts of the world and then it, they ended up being a song for me. And so it doesn't, for me, it, it doesn't really start out that way. But sometimes it'll go that way, and I just had to accept the fact that it's going to go that way. <laughs> <laughs> and so do you agree, Chris Parker? I mean, is, does your music just start in the ether, or does it start from a political place? Uh, well, music starts from all kinds of places. <laughs> so it, it depends on what strikes, strikes your mood. Uh, especially jazz musicians, we live in the moment. So mm -hmm. you may wake up and see a beautiful sunrise and maybe you want to play off of that 
And then you may turn on the TV and see some stuff that messes your head up. And so you respond to that, too. you got to remember, a lot of people called train, well, he's play- why does he sound so angry? Why is he this? Why is he that? And then when you – everything I've heard in inter- interviews, I didn't get to meet Coltrane. I mean, I know Kid got to meet Coltrane, but I don't think he was thinking of anything but his horn. And they drew inferences based on what was going on. Kid was just playing more off the energy – of the moment and if you drew a political conclusion okay fine sure when he wrote alabama that's a direct thing sure when mingus wrote fables of Fabus, that was a direct thing okay but not every time that they got it picked up their instrument to play was it about politics but the energy that they brought you know a lot of people might be a little hypersensitive and have a little bit of a guilt trip and so it's not easy to trick. I mean, you can trigger a, an emotion quite easily in them, and you didn't mean to make them feel that, you know. That's what but I mean by ways. now they're like, "Why is he so angry? Why is he <laughs> yeah. hollering on his horn? Why won't he play something I know?" And it's Why like, does she "What she sound like? She's crying." Why is he? <laughs> You know, well, we're just playing our music. You're the one with these emotional responses to our music. We didn't. Uh, some, in other words, sometimes it's direct and sometimes it's not. I see. And so, and so, you know, Mr. Lavelle. I mean, um, you know, uh, jazz has often been called black liberation music. <laughs> you know, mm. is it simply a political act to be a jazz musician? No. No, no, because um, musicians don't have any, uh, um, uh, the music chooses us, first of all. We don't choose the music, you know, and I learned that, you know, my commitment, people don't understand how a person of my age can be committed, you know, to getting up and practicing, you know, daily, you know, to until I can't, you know, I don't practice as long as I did when I was younger, you know, but, uh, but, but, but I do it daily and I do it with the same in, intensity. And back to your question, sometimes I write things that are specifically political. That was my objective and that's what I was looking to do. And sometimes things write themselves based on my emotions, mm-hmm. what, like what Chris was saying, however I'm feeling, you know, it could, in fact, um, I heard it somewhere. I'm not the one who originated this, but they said once you can expose yourself, you know, you'll become a great songwriter. And uh, to expose yourself uh, emotionally, you know, if you if you you were in love and you she broke your heart and you can really express that honestly and completely and let somebody see you. Right. You know, being vulnerable like that. You know, that's a, a some someone can share in that because they felt that, too. You know, and so we have a kinship uh, in, in that particular song. So it, it's various, various, you know, emotion, various things, you know, uh, precipitate a, a, a song. Sure. Yeah. And the truth of the, and, you know, and the truth of the matter, is that, you know, that is one of the allures of particularly early country music. You know, the storytelling and the emotional honesty. Um, well, you know, there's a great music. story it's, it's, it's about Bird, music, period. you know, who would listen to country music, you know, on the jukebox and say, yeah, but stories, it's not just country know. music it's in music, period. Oh, no, no. I, of course. Yeah. Of course. I'm just teasing out something from what you're saying, you know, in that sense. You know, I mean, there's some songs, Broadway mm-hmm. sh- songs. You know, that will rip your heart out if you listen to the story. Yes. You know, and if, you know, mm. um, I kind of miss that in today's music. You know, they go for the beat real quick before they have a, a, a full and complete story. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, but uh, it's, I miss uh, that, too. I miss so, uh, that, too. Yeah. So yeah. The lyrics are kind of get back a little. Uh, the melodies out. All of that. <laughs> did, did we lose kid? Hmm? Have we lost no, him? We, no. Okay. There you, oh, I thought we lost you. I'm so happy to know that you're there. I do want to share one thing, however. Um, when I was in uh, college, I used to make it my business to be the guy who would carry musicians around when they came to town. There was a, my favorite vibraphone player of all time was Milt Jackson. 
and Kelly's brother and I, I got I got the job to drive Milt Jackson around for a day, and so I went and got Kelly's brother. I knew Kelly's brother before we were ever married, and I also knew her mm-hmm. uncle Frank Lowe before we were ever married. Yep. But um, Milt drove us around, and he said many things that day, and of the few things I can tell you in public, <laughs> one thing he said was, it was his firm belief that in the 1960s, the government made a concerted effort to remove jazz from the black community because it was an enlightening music in which the listener had to think, and they did not like that element. And so they tried to remove jazz. They put it in white educational settings. They did anything they could but leave Again, not to be too vernacular, but they weren't going to leave jazz in the hood because it enlightened black people's minds. And at that time, I thought, wow, that's really, I don't know if I can agree with that. However, if you look at the music that is now fed daily to the African-American community, and I mean, when you drive your children to school, turn the radio on and see what they are listening to, it is extremely the opposite of listening to Charlie Parker and John Coltrane and the effect that that has on your cognitive function. Chris, there was one year I was in Japan. In the elevator, jazz was played. In the restaurant, jazz was played. We stopped at a gas station, jazz was playing, and we asked, why do you listen to so much jazz? And it was told to us that we found that people were more productive when they were listening to jazz than when they were listening to any other music. I don't know how true it is. I just know that's what we were told. So that's that's very interesting. That you know. is interesting. That really is. And, you know, they say that the 20th century was the rhythm century, you know. Mm-hmm. But uh, but uh, sometimes uh, the rhythm, uh, you know, uh, sometimes at the expense of melody, mm-hmm. which, you know, I mean, and in the melody can sometimes come the message, yes. <laughs> you know. Um, so, Mr. Mr. Jordan, are you still there? Yes, yeah, I am. Yeah. Oh, good. Oh, good. And so let me ask you this. I mean, when you think about your own music, when you have created your music, do you is it a reflection of you and your times or do you see it as something different from that? I started playing among uh, like people you see. Speak up. Bandstand, when I get on a bandstand, instead of using keys, I tell them to what key? Whiskey. So we can start from there. And if really, if I get with people who really can't hear, it's a problem. But if they can follow me with the keys, I can follow them. I'll go where they go or they go where I go. Then it's more of a, of a, a marriage. You know of a marriage. Saying? Yeah, Mr. Mr. Jo- Mr. Jordan, please um, come a little bit closer to the microphone and speak up a little bit, because I-, I know that you have spent a lot of time in Europe playing, and so can right, you right. can you talk a little bit about the reception that you're that you're receiving in uh, in Europe versus your experiences in the United States? Well, in Europe, I get a better reception because uh, they know what I'm. They have an idea what I'm going to do. But in the United States, they want to throw you in two to five or so and so and so and box you in. But in Europe, sometimes I, I play with people say, where well, this called came from? Or what kind of key we in? We in such and such and such. And a lot of times, I don't even think about key. Say, so what key? We in whiskey. And we just go on and do what we got to do. You know, because it's all music and anybody going to die from it. You're not killing nobody. You know what I mean? And, and if you dare to make, to be a star, then you wouldn't be, I wouldn't be there if I was trying to be a star. Because I've been with all them rhythm and blues players. And half of them was out of tune when they were saying. I used to be <laughs> with, with rhythm and blues players. They'd have to practice a half a day to keep them in key, especially when he was putting out them, them hip 
them hip rhythm and blues uh, uh, label, you know. So it's oh. all a crapshoot. And so and I'd like to come. And if you the first time. Have fun. I love that. I love that. The first that. time I was out of the country, uh, we went to France. There was a festival in France, and they had three stages in a big uh, area. Uh, and to make a long story short, throughout that area, they had bust of various jazz musicians honoring various jazz musicians. I've never seen anything like that here. Mm. So they had, a, they had a much greater respect for what the uh, jazz musicians were doing and are doing than we have here. You know, the music, like uh, Chris said, this music is suppressed, and I don't know why. It is a wonderful music. It's not going to die. You know, it's going to be around forever. But uh, it has been really uh, uh, damaged here in this country. Mm. And so uh, we don't have very much time left, but I wanted to leave to leave the last question to the two of you, Kelly Hurt and um, and um, Christopher Parker. Um, when you think about music, the music that you're going to create that will represent this moment in time, we're living at a very contentious moment in American life. Um, we have an unresolved election. We have an unresolved feelings. We have unresolved feelings of discontent and anger um, between strangers, you know, in this country. You know, I mean, what is your music going to sound like, do you think? (laughs) (laughs) Ask an easy question. (laughs) I'll tell you this. Um, It has been five years of surprises for us. That this music, we kind of all kind of joked about it as he started the initial process and we started outlining together how it was going to come come together. And um, we are surprised every year by the longevity of this piece simply because it's so relevant to now. And the each year that passed, we would go, wow. This this is actually a living a living musical art and that's what I can say that's what we always try to produce and we try to always perform in the moment so the same song that you may know it's probably going to sound different the next time you hear it and also with this piece that we're doing now we call it a living art because like the words that you hear me doing the narrative they change they they eventually change. They evolve. The more we meet people, the the members of the nine, they change to reflect what's going on currently, and it's just so relevant to today. So, mm. uh, you know, they asked Monk that where's where's jazz going, and he said, I don't know where jazz is going. It's going where the music. Musicians take it. Maybe it's going to hell. <laughs> um, that's in a downbeat interview. And I think that for me, I'm not going to be so radical, but what I've realized, especially in the middle of the turbulence, is that as a culture, we are tremendously out of tune. And that's the best way I can put it. We are out of tune with the earth itself. We're out of tune with each other. We're out of tune with our own selves. People say things that don't even make sense to their own selves. Mm. So what I'm looking for at this point is a type of music that can somehow relax people to get back. You know, kids talking about people being out of tune. Is is it a way that as a that we can play something that will pe- draw people back? And I'm not talking about a four forty. I'm talking a, that's a musical term for those <laughs> of you who don't know what a four forty is. I'm not talking about specific in tuneness on a on a tuning scale. I'm talking about to be in tune with each other. Can we find a way to play music? Because ultimately, the best music when you hear a band that's in tune with each other. Like today, we played with Brian on drums. Brian Blade? And, yes, yes, and Roland Guerin. And on the bass. fact that they had known each other so long, their in tuneness with each other, that was just inspiring. Yes. So I'm looking, that's, 
I don't know where the music is going. Maybe it is going to hell. But what I'm looking for is a music that will somehow pull a group in tune with each other and an audience back in tune with humanity's out of touch with its own self. Christopher Parker, Kelly Hurt, and Bobby Lavelle joined us. They are, uh, they are the creators of uh, a wonderful piece of music called the No Tears Suite. And um, Kid Jordan, the saxophonist and educator and all-around hero of jazz. We love you, kids. Love you. Also, remotely. <laughs> My name is Gwen Tompkins. It's been a pleasure. Oh, it's been a pleasure talking to you all. And thank you to Oxford American and to the National Park Service. And I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. Thank you to all of the panel members, um, Oxford American, our other co-sponsors, the National Park Service. I uh, was proud to bring you this event. Tune back in on December 3rd. We're going to be streaming a concert uh, production of the No Tears Suite. Um, so join back in December 3rd. Look for us on Facebook and YouTube. We'll see you then. Thanks. Jeez. Now let's put our mask back on. Damn, you just